Jambia, sure. thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. I can't wait to talk about what you're doing with AgriLedger. But before we dive into that, I'd love to talk about some of the other things you've done before you started AgriLedger, if that's okay. That'd be wonderful. Yes. Thank you for having me, Kathy. <laughs> Absolutely. So you have a really interesting career path. And you spent a number of years in finance and working around financial inclusion in Africa. Could you explain what financial inclusion is and why it's important? I have another life which started before finance. I actually worked in healthcare and worked on Taxol, uh, on cancer research and did research because I studied biochemistry in school and I worked for Sloan Kettering. And then that was around the time that the um, Clinton first came in and we started talking in the US about United, you know, healthcare for everyone. And that's basically made the whole healthcare to go topsy turvy. And I decided at that point that instead of staying in the healthcare space, I would go into finance. And that's how I ended up. But before actually even hitting that, I actually worked for MTV Network for about a year and a half, and then ended up in finance. And MTV that really Network? was, for me, the place. Yeah, I worked doing Yo! MTV. <laughs> I used to go and speak with them. And basically, also, when uh, Jenny, um, what I can't, I can't forget her name. I kind of forget her name. That was like in the 1980s, you know, like when MTV was really hot on 42nd Street. I was working in technology with MTV. And wow. then I decided, you know what? I really didn't like the, uh, the entertainment industry. And to me, um, working in finance made sense, but it was also still sort of like, I always see things around the corner. And to your question about what is financial inclusion to me, financial inclusion is not just creating an account for someone, but it's creating the ability for them to work and make money and consistently build that account and move up the ladder of the financial uh, system. So that could be getting access to credit, getting access to financial services if they need it. And financial services can be just getting cash in hand, but also being able to have um, what I would say is an income which allows them to feed their family, send their children to school, and actually have a day when they don't have to work. So uh, it's not enough to give people access to a bank account or to a mobile account. But you need to give them the mechanism by which they can actually make the money that is necessary to fulfill their daily needs. Incredible. And how are you able to support financial inclusion? What, what impact were you able to see and make? Um, what actually the way we were doing it, looking at it was actually in digital identity, believe it or not, because if an individual is not recognized as living by the state, he then does not have an identity to then be able to get access to services or to financial services. So what we were working on was actually pro, uh, doing digital identity a project looking at digital identity for young girls uh, in Africa and being able to, through that mechanism, uh, not only include them, but include their family. Um, one of the most, you know, people don't realize that, but the most influential in a household is actually a teenage girl, not the boy, not the father, not the mother, because usually they're the one who have the social life and the demands, which basically drive the financial aspect of the family. And this was looking in South Africa. And it's, they are usually the influencers because they are at the cusp of learning new things and accepting new things. And through that, they can also help their family in adopting new new technology, new ways of doing things. So if you can use that 16 to 18 year old um, pocket as a mechanism to actually uh, educate the family, that actually makes sense. 
That's super interesting. Um, and you mentioned about not having a digital identity. And one of the things listed on the Agri Ledger website is that 1.1 billion people globally don't have a digital identity, which can be a hurdle in in many aspects of their life, right? So it doesn't need to be digital right now. It's what we're suggesting is a digital identity is a way to go forward. But these people do not have a recognized identity. Uh, many of them may not even have a, um, a birth certificate. And when, where we find the majority of those individual, unfortunately, are in Africa and in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and also in Southeast Asia. And as a result, they're not counted. And one of the challenges is if they're not counted, the government or that, um, that nation does not get the support that they might deserve, or they're not recognized, and which means they're not valued. So one of the um, shocks for me about a month ago was finding out about the refugee problem in the DRC, in, uh, in the Congo, in the East. It is actually bigger than the refugee problem that is going on in Lebanon, uh, or from the Middle East, uh, there's over 5 million of them and there is nothing being done and they're being caught between uh, the Ethiopian border and they're getting massacred and no one has a mechanism to actually do anything about it. It's scary. It's scary. Oh and I would say the same thing is happening also in Asia with the the whole issue is it where is it? Is it Indonesia? With that, um, they they just it's not Indonesia. They just had the flare up um, in Myanmar. Sorry, Myanmar. Myanmar is also um, right now, and I think that you we don't really have a way to stop these atrocities. Mm -hmm. And if you can, and the reason why. I actually advocate for digital identity is that you can get self-sovereign identity, which gives information to be able to count the person and to say that person exists and provide information, but does not put in the roles of total information to where now you can actually have a repeat of the Rwandan massacres, where if you were Tutsi or you were in the wrong camp, you could actually get murdered and unfortunately we human beings as can be the cruelest of animals at time and that's something that really we have to use technology judiciously to be able to protect those that we are putting onto those technologies hmm. so much about what you just said and i want to take a second to add some context to a couple of things so when talking about Rwanda, for people who aren't familiar with that episode, it was genocide that happened and it was specific to certain uh, tribes or ethnic groups. So what you're saying from a digital identity standpoint, you don't necessarily include that type of information that could at some point be used as targeted information. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. And you may actually have that information, but you're not able to retrace that information. So let's say your own identity may have the markers that define who you are, but no one else is able to have that information to be able to understand where all these individuals are as a group to be able to marginalize them. This, you know, so Rwanda is the last one that we remember but there was also the whole Kosovo issue. Yeah. So it is not just a African problem. It also has happened in European. It's happening in, Asia, in Southeast Asia. And we are not aware of those. Um, you know, yes, the um, news talks about it. I mean, like I've been very surprised how many days it took almost a week for us to find out about the latest issue that's happening in the Palestine. I mean, it's just finally hit the economists. And again, to me, that is a marginalization of society 
even what's happening in um, Palestine. I'm not going to say that I want to take side versus uh, the Israel side versus the Palestine side, but when you have civil liberty being squashed for human being based on their ethnicity or what community they belong to, when we look at moving to a digital world, we have to be very careful. That's why even though I love blockchain, I am not a proponent yet of putting digital identity and markers on the blockchain until somebody proves to me that there is no way to get that information. And I love technology, but technologists are not trust conscious people. We have too many issues of cyber security breaches. And what I have worked in the trust industry, which is um, the trust provider, which are identity providers. And those individual are the highest level of cybersecurity and key management, which is necessary when you're dealing with identity. So it's very important to sort of understand what exactly we may be um, putting at risk in terms of individuals. Mm -hmm. I think you made some really good points there. And one just point of reference, yeah, genocide is something that's happened everywhere. And a really great reference on that is a book called A Problem from Hell. America and the Age of Genocide, written by Samantha Power, which I'll put in the show notes. But it gives a really deep chronology of a number of genocides that had happened and the role that America played or chose not to play within in those atrocities. Um, but that gets a little bit into a divergence. I want to go back to blockchain. And I heard you mention in an interview that you fell in love with blockchain which ultimately is the foundation for the company you created, AgriLedger. Can you explain what blockchain is and why you fell in love with it? Um, to me, blockchain is this technology which brought into reality something I've been trying to do for many years, which is straight through processing. The idea of straight through processing means that most things work the way they're supposed to. So you don't need to have checking along the, the value chain. And it does, it, if, if it falls on the floor, you can get enough information to be able to make sure that the next time it uh, does work the right way. So one of the key things about blockchain, for those who don't know, it's really a database. At the end of the day, it's a database. But it's a database which has different com a different way of being in that whatever you write to that database, you can have people um, provide their opinion or provide their view, and that's memorialized. So you know you have different proof, which is proof of stake, proof of work, all these things. But at the end of the day, it's everyone saying what is my version of the truth. And if let's say I change my mind or there is more history that happens, the old history does not get erased. So that's where the block and the chain comes in. You start adding links to this information. We can agree that there's been a change and we're now in agreement, or we can have information. That's really the basis of the Bitcoin and the Ethereum blockchain in that you're exchanging value. And I say, yes, I agree to do this. You add something called smart contract, not really contract, the algorithms. So rules that says if an event happens, so if you call me and I answer the phone, then we speak could be a rule. And I then have to do something. So those are the basis. But now if we start thinking about it, information is also valuable. So if I take information and I say this information is the truth of the moment, even if it's a lie, but it's the truth of the moment, and I can take that and I can start moving forward and looking at what happens, there is value in the information that is gathered and a decision can be made to pay or not to pay. So if something is good or bad at the end. So what really you start getting is a trusted database, trusted data, 
Now, which means if you're going to do machine learning or AI and decision making, allowing for decision, decision making to be made, you can then actually get to where you don't need 20 people to actually come to those decisions. You need the machine and you're basically trusting in ways that things have happened. Now, obviously you could have garbage in or garbage out and that's a fundamental problem. That is when you overlay digital identity because I know that you're trusted. So that's the difference between a public blockchain and a permission blockchain. A public blockchain, I can write whatever I want, put it on, hash it into a blockchain. So hash is a way of writing the code, uh, encrypted code into the, the database and say, this is my truth. Now you can, it is my truth and I've done it on that day and I can change it. And that is, you know, um, right now the hottest thing in case nobody has heard is the NFT which is non-fungible token, which means it's for one thing only. You can't, and that's not true. It's an asset, it represents an asset and it can't be anything else. So you can take it from one asset to another asset class, which is cryptocurrency or cash. And what has been happening is not only are artists getting into the game, but even the big uh, food companies and all Nike, I think even got into it. I, I'm not sure if Nike, but all the big names are also getting in and doing NFTs. Um, the, you can take a saying, which is famous and get an NFT. Somebody actually paid a million dollars to name a plane as an NFT. So it is the wild west, but it is actually going to have value later on because if you can think about it, if you can digitize or do a digital twinning of an asset, which is physical with this blockchain information, you memorize that it actually exists. And from there, you can actually put a value. So you can say, because this item exists, this is the value that I give on it. And as time goes by, so imagine you're an artist, as time goes by, you can actually put a debenture in there uh, that says, if you owner one sells it, I get 20% of whatever the price you get to agree. So every time it sells, the artist gets some more money. Or if you create something for a billboard, so if you are a model, and this is a problem a lot of models have, they, their pictures is used in campaign that they haven't agreed to. But now imagine it's an NFT. Every time that digital image is used, there's a remuneration that goes automatically to them because there is that algorithm, which we call smart contract sitting underneath. Some of the countries like the UK are looking at how to make those smart contract become real contract because you and I, if we agree to have a transaction, we're agreeing to be governed by this smart contract. But the problem that we have right now is we probably, I may have transparency of what I've put in the smart contract, you as the buyer do not have. And how do we make sure that there's a level playing field? And those are some of the challenges that need to be addressed. And also IP and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> All the fun things. Um, there's so much you said there. So for the, uh, non-fungible asset, um, for the people who don't know, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes, uh, why it's getting a lot of traction right now was a digital piece of art that was recently sold for millions of dollars. Um, 69 million. 69 million. And it's a digital piece of art. So that obviously made headlines. And one of the things that makes, um, this type of asset really interesting that you mentioned that's never existed before is especially when you're dealing with art or the creation of something is you can attach to it essentially what we would call royalties 
so that every time it's sold forward, the artist gets a percentage of whatever the increased value is, which has never been the case before. So it, it's creating a space or revolutionizing the way that um, artists might benefit from their work long term going forward, which is really interesting. Now, Agriledger, your company, yes. uses blockchain. And before we get into that, I want to give some background to the listeners just on agriculture in general. So not only do all of us need the agriculture industry to eat, but agriculture remains central to the world economy. Actually, 60% of the population in the world depends on agriculture for survival. And data from the World Bank shows that globally about 1 billion people work specifically in the agriculture sector. But there are stark differences in employment in agriculture between rich and poor countries. So the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, 69% of employed people work in agriculture, whereas in the United States, it's only about 1%. So agriculture if you look at Afri Africa as a whole, is by far the largest economic activity. It provides employment for two thirds of the continent's working population. And for each country contributes an average of 30 to 60% of gross domestic product and about 30% of the value of exports. So to say that agriculture is an important industry would be quite an understatement. And your company, AgriLedger, focuses on the agriculture supply chain. So how would you explain what AgriLedger is to a high school student? What is it trying to do with the agriculture supply chain? Um, we don't try to talk about the supply chain, but more about the value chain. Okay. How do you transfer value from one individual and also, so this is about de-risking. So a high school student probably would not understand de-risking very well. But the idea is that if you can make it to where someone can maintain ownership further down the value chain, then they can receive a bigger payment back for their labor. And those who are in between provide a service. So. For high school student, in most places, it's an Uber or a taxi driver. You want to get from place A to place B, you hire somebody to take you there versus that person buying. So you're trying to take a gift, that person buying the gift from you at a lower price, taking it and then selling it up at the store or on your, not on your behalf, but on their behalf. So they provided you to liquidity, which means that they had a risk or they didn't know if what you gave them was worth everything, but they made a calculated risk that they would be able to sell it further and make maybe 10 times what they paid you. So now, if you make sure that the quality and what is needed, you control, you then can employ people who support you in getting it to market, which means once it reaches the market, it is you who's getting that 10x from what you would have paid before. And from there, you have enough money to actually pay those individuals who supported you along the journey. So as somebody said to me, it's like giving a passport to the fruit to actually get to where it needs to go. And that requires education in terms of what does quality mean and also requires bringing accountability so in ways what we're looking to do is to create a new class of entrepreneurship which is starting at the producer level and that is actually very interesting you know we were just talking about nft that's also what nft is doing because usually when we look less than 1% of artists actually make money during their life. And 10% of them only are able to actually be able to work as an artist without having a second job. But now, if you can actually produce something and watch it go through the value chain and you're actually distributing it, 
You no longer need that middleman who would pay you pittance to then get the buyers out for you. So it's really about changing the way we work as a world. And that is something which is possible because of communication. And I think that the pandemic has actually accelerated this mechanism of collaboration because before you, you, you know, you thought, well, I can't work with these people because I can't go and see them. Now everybody can do it on the phone, Zoom. Um, there's, you know, Microsoft is for free. You can get on with somebody and talk. So which means you can now start getting things further afield than just where you live. And that's an opportunity that uh, has opened itself really to, to the world, to the globe. That's so interesting. Um, and I liked how you showed the analogy of the artist to then the, the farm producer, the agricultural producer. And through the process of production to ultimate sale or buying, finding a way to help um, redistribute some of the value along, yeah. along that system. And if you think about it, because the reason why I advocate for blockchain is because you don't need to have so many people checking in and checking out, checking that something has happened. And also you have an electronic record, not a paper record, which is buried somewhere. You can now trust. And that means that I hopefully see also a benefit to the consumer who is made aware of where the food comes from. It also gives the food company and the food distributors the ability to be able to assure where their goods are coming from, who are their suppliers, if there's any problem in the supplier chain to be able to address those without risking passing that information to the customer and being too late and having an infraction. So the idea is what we did is we started with the producers because if you start with the producers, you then create crowd and the crowd is getting more money, more uh, ability to actually get to bigger markets. They then start demanding a certain level of servicing. Then the next thing is to work with the suppliers and the food manufacturers to support them in being able to understand what they're receiving, which means that chain of custody. So they don't need three or four people between them and the farmer, they can get it directly. And then understanding what are the processes that they're taking in their environment, either in transformation or whatever, to then make sure that if there's any infraction, they can deal with it. And also they can have a better trade finance view of what their expenditures are and not have five or six people in between, which is inflating the price and not giving them the quality that they necessitate. So it actually brings that whole crop funding in ways uh, together. Interesting. And what do you mean when you say um, infraction? What would be an example I mean, like of that? Um, you have an E. coli mm -hmm. <laughs> or listeria uh, outbreak. You have uh, some broken glass, which is found or some dirt. And now you need to know which lot number it is and you need to know very quickly where it came from. Did it happen in your um, company's floor or did it happen from the farm? And being able to, you know, I mean, if we look at what has happened in the US, not once, but twice last year, unfortunately, or let's say fortunately, there was less casualties from it. But the lettuce issue, the romaine lettuce, which had E. coli, uh, in 2018, I believe, 2018, 2019, they were about 60 dead across the country. And it took almost four or five weeks to be able to find out. And people were throwing all lettuce out because they didn't know. And unfortunately, in 2020, we had a repeat. Fortunately, this time, there wasn't as many casualties. But there were a lot of people who were also still sick. And it, didn't, it took too long to actually figure out. And so what happens is that most food uh, companies 
have very rigorous processes for testing and also making sure. And so we sh there is going to be problems every once in a while, but if you can get to the answer of those problems much faster, so this is the Walmart example of wanting to know where the mango came from, it used to take six weeks and they were able to get that answer in six seconds once they had it on the blockchain. So data is available to you in a digitized fashion versus of having to go and figure out either what system is it in or what piece of paper is it written upon. And if you can find out information very quickly, then you can actually stop a problem very quickly. And I advocate for permission databases with data that can be public and everybody has to agree what data is public. But critical identifiers should not be there because if not, we're not gonna get enterprise to actually play. They need to come back and say what they will allow eventually to be public information. And most of these companies are regulated. So the regulator can have a view to information that we as public do not have. If there's, so if there's a problem, they can go and do the investigation and see that information without us having a need to see it in the public, but because we know the regulators are looking for it. But if we try to put certain things on public blockchain, people will not participate because at the end of the day, I actually don't think that IP is issues. I think it's USB how you do something, how you develop something, how you de deliver a service is usually much more secret than the IP. And the biggest example of that are banks. When you look at Chase Man Bank versus Citibank, they both do banking, but in different ways, how they treat their customers in different ways and what they tell their customer is what their USB is. So they do not have IP, they have USB. Mm. Interesting. Um, there's a couple of things I wanna build off of that you touched on or just reemphasize. So one is that one of the things AgriLedger is trying to do is help with quality control um, mm -hmm. within agriculture. So using the E. coli example. And to put the need of that in perspective. So according to the World Health Organization, who did the first ever estimate of global burden of food borne diseases, they showed that almost one in 10 people fall ill every year from eating contaminated food, and about 420,000 die as a result. And one of the really big issues of this is that this disproportionately affects children under the age of five they account for 30% of those deaths. So beyond just trying to improve distribution effectiveness, your company is trying to also increase the quality of food and the traceability of food. So what, when there is an outbreak, it can be addressed a lot faster and fewer people would be impacted and ultimately be at risk of dying from foodborne related illnesses. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I had a bout about three weeks ago of mm -hmm. uh, food poisoning and it put me out for six days. Had I been a child, I don't know, if, and, it, and then I was sick another week from it. So I understand that. And there's two things also. If you can get to quality and you get paid for quality, you can also reduce waste because everyone is then, you know, we talk, we're talking a lot these days about regenerative agriculture and the fact that really food waste accounts for, a, I can't remember the number, a very high number of the green gas uh, depletion. So therefore, if we can reduce the amount of food that we're wasting, we can then also make sure that the food is getting to the right places and we then do not, we are also making sure that a farmer is playing a different game, not a quantity game, but a quality game. So the quality gets paid the right price and therefore he, does, he or she does not need to produce more in order to make money. 
and that's one of the concept because food, um, you know, we talk about food safety, we just covered that, but also food security is another issue. Uh, I was flabbergasted around Thanksgiving in 19 last year to hear that the US due to the pandemic had six out of 10 individual which were food deprived, which were, you know, food security issues. So with the pandemic, um, it was actually going the wrong way before the pandemic. And the FAO talked about that, that every year we were going by 10 million in a wrong direction of people who were not food secure. With the pandemic, it reached over 100 million people becoming food insecure. And in places such as the US where you wouldn't think that was the case, you were having a lot of people who lost their job, which meant that they didn't have the mechanism to feed themselves or their children. So we need to be able, we have enough food to feed the planet several times over, not once, but several times over. But the majority of it goes into the bin so we need to change that and by do the way to do that is to make sure that whatever it is produced gets to the right places and also is paid adequately yeah it's that distribution effectiveness piece that supply and demand matching and also i think the um quality piece is a part of it too so the example of uh e coli on lettuce we have to throw all of it out right? Because you don't know what's contaminated and what's not, which adds to the food waste. One of the statistics on the AgriLedger website, which I thought was really eye-opening, was that 870 million people, hungry people in the world, could be fed if just one-fourth of the food currently lost or wasted globally could be saved. Just a quarter of the food lost or wasted. So that number is huge. It's twice the size of the U.S. population, to put it in perspective. And so when you talk about there being enough food created to feed the world, it's just, an, and to some extent, an allocation problem or a distribution mm -hmm. problem. So getting it to the right place at the right time. It's, I think it's that. And it's also one of the things that I was very surprised and I ended up having to go Google was that in Africa, only 10% of arable land is actually being um, used. So which means you are not producing enough food locally to feed the population, which means that food has to be imported and that means expensive and not in the reach of those who need it. And therefore there isn't enough food for people go hungry. So we in the West have a propensity to waste it because we're getting too much of it. And then you have other parts of the world where they're not equipped. And part of the challenge in Africa is infrastructure. So if you don't have road and you don't have potable water, you then cannot access those locations to actually create farms. And if you don't have electricity, you then do not have the mechanism to actually process that food because sending it in a raw format means that you get a much lesser price than if you actually even just make it look pretty, you get a better price. And as such, you need to then have the cold storage if it's fruits, or if it's grain, you need to have the right humidities and the right uh, environment. So it's really that piece of educating what is necessary to be able to go at scale. And scale doesn't need to be one individual putting it together. It could be several people having a shared value, shared responsibility of doing this piece of work together. And that's the way we need to change things. We need to impart our knowledge and let them come together to do the necessary. And to me, technology is a way of taking up the burden of recording what has happened. So 
I love things like Expensify because I take a picture of my receipt, it uploads it, and later I can do something. You know, I can submit my, my expenses versus if I have to sit there and take everyone, type it in Excel, I can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And so if we can use technology to make things faster, then we can create a different, um, I don't want to say class, because that's not the right word, a different opportunity for people. So entrepreneurship is about doing things differently and forging the way to creating a new reality for yourself. So to me, it's about giving the producers that, that opportunity. And it's kind of funny when we talk about startups, we usually talk about seed road, growth, and the exit, which is the harvesting. <laughs> and that's what a producer or farmer does. That is interesting that the terminology origin for startups comes from agriculture. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love that. So you recently did a project in Haiti, which is actually where you're from. Can you talk a little bit about what the project is? Sure. Uh, actually, the project in Haiti actually predated me about seven years, and it's part of the World Bank uh, DAI, which is basically development aid investment that they did. And what they did was working with local farmers looking at how to alleviate the bottom 40% of poverty in Haiti. And it's not only Haiti, it's really across the world. When you look at the bottom 40, you will normally find them in the agricultural uh, supply chain and subset. And so what they started looking at were all the projects that are available in Haiti. How, pro how easy was it to grow? How easy was it to bring to a farmer? And then how could you actually cut down the supply chain or the value chain by creating entrepreneurs? So I am proud of my work. I am responsible for the quality of my work. And as a result, I get rewarded and I have people in between that support me. So Haiti, beside this mango, which is called the Madame Francis and has its own appellation. We believe it came from India uh, with the Spanish conquerors, but it doesn't grow anywhere else uh, beside Haiti. And there has been also attempt even Dominican Republic to replicate it, but it is not as easy as in Haiti where you, everybody will have a tree, which is just bountifully giving this mango. That mango, when it gets in the US, can be as much as two on sale for $5 or $3 on its own, or at the height of the, at the lowest season, at the beginning of the season, which is the height of the prices, one for $5. And they're huge and beautiful, green and very juicy. So that's one of the product. The other product that Haiti actually does is avocado. It has peaches, it's in that part of the Ecuador equator which has coffee cocoa and really that band which just is bountiful and most people don't even notice but uh, when Haiti got its independence from France it was responsible for 40 percent of the um, the revenue for the French and it had it made more money for the sugar than was done by all of England put together. So it was, it was very bountiful for, for the French and that's why they weren't very happy. That's why Bonaparte sent his brother-in-law to try and fix it. Um, but what they, one another thing that comes from Haiti that most people don't know is Vevier, which is used in a perfume, but it's very controlled and needs to go in certain areas. So they chose to go with the mango, avocado, cocoa and coffee, because when you grow cocoa and coffee, you can actually grow them in the shade of the other trees. So that way you get different income that can come in in between. And then what they did is that with the fruits, they brought in Wageninger University uh, out of the Netherlands to say, how do I take a fruit and get it to market and make sure 
that it's still in this best shape. That means how do you cut it? How do you make sure you bleed out the milk so it doesn't burn the skin? How do you wash it? What temperatures do you need to keep it? How do you get it into that suspended reality? And that allows you also, how do you even pack it so that they don't hit each other so you don't have this bruising happening? So all that information was put together for avocado, pineapple, and mangoes, which happened to be my favorite fruits anyway. And it was like, for me, this great opportunity to actually build a solution. But one of the things that I had always had a concern about was traceability. So traceability for the sake of traceability means that even though we're saying most customers want to know where their food comes from or how it got there, you still have a certain level of um, price. Um, you know, you might not want to pay $5 for something which came from South Africa versus something that came in from two, two kilometers away from you, which you're paying $2 because it doesn't have that same aspect. So where the aha moment was for me was what they asked for. They said, not only do we want you to trace it, but now we want you to bring the money back because that's really actually the most important part because you're removing all the middle people from the money. So the money comes back and it goes one hop and you distribute it to everyone that it needs to be. So which means you also start creating transparency you as an organization or as an individual provided a service, you were promised to be paid X, you get that X as your remuneration. And then the farmer can see, so you start getting to this idea of cost accounting. How much did it cost me for this? How much did it cost me for that? And start being able to understand what they're going to get. So we not only tell the farmer along the way where things are, but once it's been paid, we tell him a buyer has been found. So this is one of the issues though. We don't tell him how much was actually sold for because he forgets that he's got to pay other people <laughs> in between. So we then tell him how much he's going to receive. And from that amount, we've already taken all the agreement because before him relinquishing his produce, he actually signs a contract saying that he gives the right to this company to transport and transform it. He gives the right to the broker to sell it on his behalf and agrees to pay him a certain percentage. And he gives the bank the ability to deliver those payments to those to whom it's owned and to us as a company, the right to distribute the data where it's needed. So that empowers the individual actually to be the owner of the goods and we did it last year during the height of the pandemic. Um, and for me, I say we, but I was stuck in Jersey at the time because I couldn't fly anywhere. They actually stopped boats and flights, everything from Jersey by that point. Uh, and we did it through technology, through WebEx, through WhatsApp, through the phone to actually be able to communicate with those on the ground. So we actually, they actually went with about 47% of the farmers saying that they were interested in about 200. But as things got worse in May and we started understanding what was happening with COVID, they actually went to one community, which was about 50 farmers. And they collected about 38,000 in kilo in uh, during six weeks there was a loss of either because of issues like there was a uh, light was taken away and the mangoes were in the hot bath, which meant they fried. So they couldn't go uh, to the US. So electrical shock to the, to the mangoes. And that meant 23,000 were sold and the 23,000 netted about $40,000. But the beauty of this was that prior the farmer might have gotten about 500 to 2,000. The reason I say 500 to 2,000 is because you'd have to say, 
is the exporter buying it directly from them or is there an intermediary? So the top price was 14 cents. So I'm going to go an intermediary. It's probably going to take 50 to 60% overhead on that because they're doing the transport to get it to the exporter. So 14 cents top would have been about $2,000. And when the return of the cash came in, I was actually shocked. The farmers received 68% of the revenue and it was a 750% time. So 7.5 times what they would have gotten normally. Wow. So, so you're saying it's before 16 cents would be like per mango around. 14 cents per kg, per not per kilogram. mango, per Which kilogram then... a kg. In the US, the price can be between 250 wholesale kg to maybe 375, depending on when it is. Last year was a very strange time because if you recall, at first the US was not accepting any, people didn't know, could you pass COVID mm -hmm. food? And they weren't sure about that. And also the US sends the inspectors to Haiti. So it was making sure that individuals were willing to go back to Haiti because the COVID started before actually starting to have the season. So you needed to get people who would go and be actually inspector and be fine with living in Haiti with the fear of knowing, could I catch COVID? So those were sort of the equation that were at play. So about 250 a kg without knowing that this fruit, you could tell that five days ago it was harvested. So all that information was not part of the marketing effort. It was just getting it from Haiti to the broker, letting him sell it and getting back the cost accounting. So taking out what was paid for the transportation, the broker, the transformer and getting the difference back to the farmers. So just on that, the farmer, instead of getting 14 cents, got $1.86 on average. Wow. So if you go 14 to 186, seven times, which is 750% increase. Now, Incredible. if you start being able to say, say, you as a customer, you know where it came from, and you know also that 60% of it is going back to the person who has produced it, you will have a different attitude to it. And to me, the best thing was this community in the middle of nowhere in the mountains of Haiti, it's called Gromon, big mountain. Instead of having $2,000, received $28,000 in profit. So do you imagine the impact that has? And it is not, and to me, it is the best way to make money because being given it versus having it be the fruit of your labor is such a different thing. It's, and um, it's been making my heart go for joy that they are calling the government on a daily basis and saying, when are you coming to pick up the mangoes? That is so incredible. What an incredible validation point that project has on the impact that Agriledger can have within redistributing value along the agriculture supply chain, the ecosystem. And I think it's so important, a few things that you said. One is when looking at poverty and the bottom 40% of poverty, the fact that most of those people are in the agriculture segment. So if you're thinking about how to elevate people out of poverty globally, this is such an amazing target to do that and to make an impact in a sustainable way. So another thing you mentioned is the value of being paid for your work. So this isn't aid or a handout. This is restructuring the agriculture system, um, the industry in a way that the people doing the work are actually getting paid fairly for the work that they're doing and getting paid f fairly in a way that they can have a sustained living. Exactly. And it's not a handout, it's not about, it's market forces. 
And mm -hmm. through this also, you're giving them access to financial services. So it's going back to that financial inclusion. To me, financial services is being able to receive your money in any, any way that you want, because it could be mobile, it could be cash, in, or it could be in a wire, but it is your decision of how you receive that money. Obviously, you want to move people in a digital format so that it protects them because when you have liquid cash, you could be actually targeted. But at the end of the day, it becomes their money that they choose to do what they need from with it. And at the end of the day, the reality is every parent wants to see their child go to school be better and more successful than they are, and also well-fed. So if you can give, you can look to end poverty, then you can start really be able to address all the other SDGs. Obviously, there are others which have to do more with earth and infrastructure, but the first three are so basic to human need, which is poverty, access to education, and access to food. So we can look at those and obviously you then start having equality for women because your daughter, you now have enough money not only to send her brothers to school, but also send her to school. And it's, a, it's really a liberating thing because I don't, you know, I, I think that we forget sometimes and we judge people. We judge poor people without understanding what their plights are. They don't want to have a, a whole bunch of children. They have them because then they have enough hands to actually help them. They want their children to learn, but if they can't afford the school fees, they're gonna have them work with them or they're going to unfortunately place them with someone who promises them to give the child a better life. But they don't know any better and they have to go with that trust. So I think that we have, you know, if we look at the growth that happened, like let's say between the 1930s, Italy was a basket case in terms of poverty. Today, you don't see any more of that. Same thing with places like Malaysia. Malaysia was a fishing town. Now you go to Kuala Lumpur and you see some of the nicest places on earth. I mean, it's a paradise. So why can't we have that in every place? Why do we have to have less? Yes. Um, I think the work you're doing is so important and has such an opportunity for impact. So thank you for that. And we're running to the end of the interview. So I want to ask you, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you want to share? Um, not really. I think that you actually had me thinking a bit more than I have been lately and really how to continue the impact and how to, you know, so Haiti for me was the first case. And what we're looking to do next is to understand how do you engage? Because I can understand how to engage in what we call emerging economy or developing economies. But the plight of the farmer is not limited to those places. What we, you know, the developed economies such as the US or even uh, England and Germany have the same problem in that the subsidies are going away for many farmers. So that's going to change how they have to behave and their access to capital is also limited. So what we want to look at is how, you know, this is where that NFT aspect comes in. How do you create liquidity and you then provide because you have traceability and you know where things are coming from how do you democratize access for smaller holder to capital where investors can actually invest in them and be assured that they will have a return because when we look at agriculture what we see is most investments are in mega or in um, indoor farming and nothing wrong with those things, but how do you get the 80% of the world, which is in farming, the right financing? And it's not even the farmer. 
I think that where we're missing on the sustainable finance is that middle layer that we call the middlemen. Many of them su subsidize themselves by the arbitrage that they do with both ends. So if we actually remove that, we have to create a way for them to build their infrastructure and to revolutionize their services so that they can be also adept to be able to deliver the right services. Because if you don't have a cold chain and the person who's buying in the middle doesn't have the cold chain, the efforts of the farmers are wasted. So we need to equip and finance that person who needs to have that cold chain so that he or she can also make a living not just removing them from the equation. So it's that education and lifting everybody along the way together. That's beautiful. Now, where can people find out more about AgriLedger and what you're doing? So we are, we are going to update our website, but it has quite a bit of information. It's agriledger.io and all our social media are at agriledger and I'm pretty much found on all social media also, jean vierre And as you well know, I'm always talking. Uh, and really, to me, this is not, I don't see AgriLedger as the only one who's going to be in this space. We need as many of us. But my mission is to make sure that we do it the right way. And we look to create impact, which elevates everyone but also with the right set of metrics, not just saying, oh, I'm getting the farmers more money, but I'm not making sure that the people in the middle that I'm displacing are taken care of. So we need to look at the 360 and try and address everything and make sure that we, I don't want to say kumbaya, but really get to have what you have behind you. Life is beautiful for everyone. Absolutely. A holistic view. So looking at yes, what exactly. the um, second and third order consequences might be based on the changes that are being made and exactly. being intentional and cognizant about how the changes will impact everyone within the ecosystem. And it's really looking at what's in it for everyone. So you always need to put yourself in the place. So to me, technology has to be human centric, mm. not human are technology is there to help human not to make the humans go away so how do we interact with one another and that means that we have to design software and design solution which are impactful and also accepted not something that you think oh it's a great idea let me just do it and it doesn't help anyone except one part of the society if we want to live in a harmonious way, we have to make sure that everyone is taken care of. And it's not just the producer, it's also the consumer. The consumer, we're making sure that he or she does not get impacted neg negatively. I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing the great work you're doing with AgriLedger. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to you, Kathy.